different era, right? That's the cutest thing I've heard in a while. Oh, no, you did a completely different era. Okay. No, no, no. Okay, you're up and running.
And as you might know, our beloved Sacred Grounds poet Don Brennan passed away a couple of weeks ago. And our memorial reading for Don will be on Wednesday, April 23rd, which happens to also be Shakespeare's birthday. So do come. I think we'll have quite a big crowd yet. Uh, Dan Brady is hoping to be back in time for that, that one. We'll see. We're hoping. Okay. Uh, we also want to acknowledge and thank the accomplished poet Greg Pond, who will be hosting the second half of the reading, which will include the last open mic readers, the mini feature, and the raffle when you too may win a book, a magazine, or other prizes, such as these beautiful books just donated by Karen. And these are uh, things donated by poets like yourself. And uh, Clara will probably bring some also. Are there any more announcements? Anybody have any? Okay, so without further ado, we'll proceed to our first poet, who is Buford Bunting. Give a hand to Buford. Most people know this, but <clears throat> I uh, am an aide in uh, special education with the San Francisco School District, and this is about that. This is called He Bangs on Sticks. The tall boy, 15 years old, legs long like tree trunks, bangs two instrumental sticks together. Shh! The bongo player, another special ed student, implores the tall 15 year old. Keenan waits for a drummer who sounds a gongless gong, gong as Keenan adds in his two stick symphony, sometimes banging the instruments end to end. <clears throat> With long, dark brown flat top haircut and sleepy look. He sticks his head up to the world, thinking of the next time he will play with these sticks and lunchtime of sandwiches brought from home. Mr. Metro here. Too bad I did a giant coat. Mr. Natural says that the only thing I write about is the giants. And I went to, I, you know, I saw him a couple of days ago, so I wrote about the Giants. This is called Giants 2014. Buster Posey golfed the ball into the left field stands to ensure a 9-8 victory by the Giants over the Arizona Diamondbacks at Chase Field in Phoenix. All of us fans, 1,800, according to a Giants employee, cheered beyond belief as I froze in my too light jacket and plastic raincoat worn to stave off the rain during the day and early evening. I saw one of the knot hole fans whose attention I didn't get because of his drug problems and his usual put down of me and my nearly 60 year knowledge of the game first gained with my grandfather who took me almost literally to all the minor league games in our hometown of Mobile, Alabama during my early years on planet Earth. <clears throat> Here, 2,400 miles from Mobile in San Francisco, a tarp full of water sat over the wet baseball field, soaking it completely. Several large TVs were set up before uh, when I went in this to this monitor game at AT&T Park a couple of years ago. The quote, small players, about the size proportionally they are as we all sit in the stands at a live game or behind the right field fence in the knot hole were magnificent as they came back from a deficit that almost did them in and ran off many of those uh, of the tiny crowd. My diet Coca-Cola was uh, referred by an uh, was uh, rescued by an an, uh, an usher as it fell to the to the uh, stairs where we stood, apparent, watching apparently 
uh, at, uh, it dropped at his feet when I checked my backpack to see if it and uh, some chips my boss had given me to feed students during a field trip a few days ago were uh, inside the brown cloth mesh and zippered interior. The Giants looked good and performed as they had in 2010-2012, virtually winning the game in the seventh inning when they scored large numbers of runs. Who knows if that means they'll repeat as world champions as they did in 2010 and again in 2012. But of course, it was not, it was a, a devastatingly exciting start. <laughs>
because often sand mixed that with water. So there's never been a bucket in my life that holds all I want to hold. wanting to be hurt. The kicking point about how I'm injured and in pain. The moon comes up more often to look in on me. Yes, the moon visits me more often when I'm injured and in bed. Sweet, sweet moon. Thank you. Starbucks. The well abounds in fame and fortune, a fortune of nonsense. The day is half over, it has danced its lonely way upon me. Music drifts its afternoon bass way down, trying to <coughs> sing its way, its way down to the lower depths of feeling. There is nothing, and nothing there is. Willie Nelson is mournful, crying for the country depths. People have left me, and it is half my fault. The day is a past tense, trying to live up to itself. The day is sunny, but there are clouds on my mind. The day says hello to more tedium than romance. My mind is a metaphor, not the, the reality of nonsense I cannot avoid. There is no more to depth, depth than death. There is only enough. O oh, little queen of the day, as a solemn music becomes the master of the hour. None of it matters. Play is serious, more serious than any work should have been. Lines written, lines drawn in melancholy. The sun sets during the hour. It scours of skies for a Provence of promise. Five lines. I kiss like goodbye to the tides, longing for other spaces. The loneliness within me goes out to the sea. Poema, Ari Vist. I am at the beach, walking along. The white waves are like huge coiffures. The wind blowing to keep the air cold and stiff, cold and stiff as the stars. The stars stiff us occasionally, taking the black night, giving the black night a beam of light. The nature of metaphor is peculiar, as peculiar as a star not like Stalin and fluffy clouds. <laughs> Sound at Starbucks. Hail to the muses of Endor. The night is dark, dark as a black crow. The, the lights blink brightly, brightly, bright as a street lamp, street lamps that meet the night. The days of, of psalms and parades. I wonder at the cold splendor of it all. Cold is my shallow mind, my mind cold and shallow as a drainage ditch. The night's just forwards, forwards, not backwards to oblivion. The, the obvious is a clear metaphor. The metaphor becomes the expression, not the reality. Expression becomes opaque, as opaque as a palm tree in a dark, sandy desert. Lines of Starbucks. A rumble in the rubble of noise of quietude of the late afternoon might remind one of the refuge of quietude, of the long-awaited care and caresses, not a care of the coarseness of the far-reaching evening. It begins somewhere and ends nowhere, the nowheres of the cold and splinters, the splinters of serenity. Starbucks. Nothing comes of it. 
The day is quiet, noisy, and quiet. A pen tries to create. It moves across the page like a cautious centurion, a centurion of the mind. It moves across eccentricity like fear and wind. My mind is like a sleepy day moving across a sandy desert. The sapphire of the mind moving like a sapphire in the wind. Yeah. Poem at night. The Trieste is like a stone. All is bright and contemplative. Bright at night as opposed to industrious during the day. The, de the day sun makes one industrious as opposed to the night moon. The night makes one as bright as the poet sat during the day one wishes he had time to be. These are some uh, oldies. This is dated 10-27-03. Uh, Sonnet, Mother's Birthday. This is, this is when my mother was, was still alive. The wind flowed me along my torturous way towards the, the phenomenon of awards. The dynamo called Market Street among beggars beseeching shoppers anon. A subdued Halloween, a cards for mother of course, not tardy to her, thrifty Scorpio, the throng. I almost jogged by in a hurry, stopping by the post office half filled with quietude. I scurry back to the library, half thrilled. Another hard, sharp Wednesday eve. Not face to face, I only believe. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Next is Tom Orr. First of all, I'd like to announce that I will be here on the 16th to feature. Yay. Please come. Uh, I promise it will be entertaining. <laughs> um, this is a, a poem called What a Joy It Is to Be Here. Overhead, jet contrails paint, paint the sky with geometric lines of tic-tac-toe that spread from fine lines to puffy cloths to white lit sheets upon the blue beyond. Temperatures scurry up down as drought rains leaves to ground crisp dry amber flakes on hard packed dust. Topsy turvy end of August, early falls with schools in rolling fits of futuring. The times are crazy gone, and boys and girls are pip squeaky, full of hormone jumbles, wishy wanting the whole nine yards without dawdles or oven bun disasters in the works. My mailbox overflows in paper scams, while spam clogs my inbox, and I get up and out to gaze the sky full into my outbound mind. We fill with wonder, smooth of high and thanks from lovely women, men striving tall or smooth, encouraging my simpatico through sensualities. So who would cry this crystal weather down, or herons standing still, or ravens dropping stones, while siskins bolt each other off, and alders creak with pines and firs amid these scrubby underwoods. We are not did dad done, but nearly so, and mirror waters show us who we are become. Undone in such contrary wise of days, so tumult trots tirades and taunts to foster war on distant lands where folk as like to you and I cry havoc against our boasting pride, and may we stop lest we destroy this planetary metronome of wondrous, synergistic, biosphere. Um, very short one. Uh, this is kind of a fragment. Last night, the sunset filled the eastern sky with orange glow. And in the undertow, we felt a million wishes of all kinds uplifted 
from their hardy beds. We reeled inside the field and glowed as orange turned to gold. And for a moment, sky became a bowl full of all we might if we could grant each other's need. Yeah. Uh, uh, you all probably know Jeannie Lockton. Yeah. I wrote this to her recently. Jeannie, you pulled me in long ago to a hot room full of writers on the telegraph. There was so much to feel in you under your armor, your amour, your ballerina peeping out from behind those pagan Amazons so brave and tall, and then came luxuries of small poems and serial small books of American conquest, speaking so many truths from your mind, your heartbreak, your soul's desire. We thought the bridge was metaphorical, throwing yourself away, a poetic device to conjure new life, new ways of being. And we were right, even as you willed yourself alive in the bridge foot waters, saving yourself for all of us to share, for all of us to find you radiant and beautiful here in this room, in this now. And my last one, which I shared with Mr. Brady, and he said, please read it. Um, my wife said that, um, never mind. We, drove out, we dress outside of current fashion unadored by peripheral electronics, driving hybrids or older metal, and wearing hats, toupees, or odd wigs. We push walkers, tilt to a cane, or occasionally are seen with walking sticks, are often brushed past, ignored, bumped, or even shouted at for simply existing. Unknown to most of the hurry folk with their busy thumbs, ear deafened by Bluetooth, earbuds or virtual reality, I lost in a backlit virtual world. Their friends drive by equally ignorant of them and the effects of acceleration, which we, while we persevere against all odds, we, my wife, my hidden thumb, and I manage against escalating dubious change to maintain a semblance of contentment against the rising certainty of death. Before dawn, we wake to read in quiet, make coffee, check news online, and plan the day knowing we may not follow through. Eating breakfast, dressing after a short shower, we sally forth by noon, our feet and legs finally stable, our minds open to plum trees, sky vistas, the hustle of passing young faces, the ratcheting sound of business as usual. By four, we're more than ready for a nap, and after that, a modest meal, having eaten too much at lunch, that I may, with fun, engage a poetry venue to fall at last in bed by 11, to sleep in the warm smell of life and selves, dreaming with any luck our young bodies entwined on a Baja beach, and to wake and firm once more before dawn. Thus, we announce to you, who are young and full of the vigor of immortal thought, who see death in others but not yourselves, growing old requires the soul of courage. finding their way past my sleepy eyelids, songbirds practicing the next astounding symphony of the season, pigeon eggs hatching in the porch rafters, above a fire extinguisher that probably should be recharged. 
But I preferred the winter. Your head on my lap beside the fireplace, cuddled beneath the quilt patched together from your quirks and mine, which I believed to be a fine romance, and you believed was just a place of shelter. How I got to San Francisco. This is not the Cinderella story. I threw the hearth boom into the fire, told the powers that define my life to scrub their own damn floors. Very long ago, in a faraway land not worth remembering. This is not a Cinderella story. No fairy godmother waved a willow wand or invited me to come to the ball. But she showed me how to tighten lower bolts on the coach suspension and how to harness the horses over a glass of Manischewitz and some chicken soup. Not everyone is lucky enough to have a Jewish fairy godmom. This is not a Cinderella story. When I lost my shoe, the prince said, hey babe, kick off the other one, let's dance in the rain. So I tossed my ball gown to my friend Steve, who wears that sort of thing better anyway. Then me and Prince, we took an unattended brigantine that belonged to some scruffy pirate and headed for the Barbary Coast. <laughs> Gold watch. My friend, the scientist, has retired, moved to the city of angels, although she is a fan of Darwin and sees no need for divine interventions. My friend, the scientist, has retired, won't stand with me when another crazy priest tells kids they'll go to hell for heeding her words. My friend the scientist has found a home in warmer climates. No longer needs her morning shawl to keep away the city's fog. My friend says that she was ready to be a gardener, tend her pomegranates and grandchildren. But I am worried, hearing rumors, that her strong, fine mind has crashed through some guard rail on a dark three-way overpass, and she is playing Candy Crush on Facebook. <laughs> Night walk. They say the night is dangerous. Stay inside, girl, where everything is safe and warm. Can't you feel the evening's chill slithering beneath the door? Yet go I must. There are night sounds calling. Shush of waves. Mouse hurrying through emaciated autumn grasses. A distant owl and stardust falling all around. jug of wine, and thou beside me in the wilderness. Thus sang the ancient poet, let the wine picture add to the kiss of love its own. My darling, suddenly the line of your hip becomes the brimming curve of the wine goblet. Your breasts are the great cluster. A gleam of spirit lights your hair, and your navel becomes the chaste seal stamped on the vessel of your belly, your love. An inexhaustible cascade of wine light. Illuminates. 
dominating my senses, the earthly splendor of life. I like it on the table when we're speaking. The glint of light from a bottle of intelligent wine. Drink it and remember. In every drop of gold, in every topaz glass, in every purple ladle that autumn has labored to fill this vessel with wine. And in the ritual of his office, let the simple man remember to think of the soil and of his duty to propagate the canticle of the wine. So I sit and remain just as I am, barefoot, shirtless, and lazy, shielding my eyes from the glare of his disapproval as he lectures me about life in general and how tough things were for him while I'm coming up. Uh, he has to get up early each and every morning and work hard for every single thing he's done, recounting all his great accomplishments. Meanwhile, I sit <coughs> and listen and listen and sit and sit and sit. I truly admire and respect Father's work ethic, but I have in fact heard his soliloquy many times before, so my mind drifts and my eyes wander and seek the distraction. I take notice of all the potted plants sitting with me and before me along the railing of the balcony, some two dozen all in all, some mine, some yours. Others we bought together while at the nursery. You loved them all back then much more than I, so I guess that makes them all yours. I happen to notice that many of them have died, though it should come as no surprise, knowing they could not have perished overnight. And in hindsight, I watched them die in passing glances. Yes, die they did, partly neglectful, which I am to blame, partly from the summer's heat. Father lectured them too harshly, while in a weakened state, with little or no water for me. And though I'm sure you do not realize that you too are culpable for the death of your doors, and once beautiful because of you. But like children and pets, they cannot be so easily disowned or disavowed once you claim them, loved and cared for them. Even if circumstances change, they're still yours. And despite neglect, oh, I let go of my head. Oh, oh, okay. And despite neglect or abandonment, their dependency, their struggle to survive, to live, and to grow, continues or fades. Father goes on speaking in ranting voice, fading in and out as I look at the dead, at their shriveled, dirty, brown, brittle bodies, crumpled, pitifully dry, emaciated, nested with spiders in their scurvy white webs, contemptible eyesores to any who's never witnessed their days of glory. It occurred to me they must have been dead for quite some time, and I began to wonder why I'm not tossed them out by now. Maybe it's because I'm not ready to replace them with the resplendent new young and alive who gave a Leah that would bring pleasure to my eyes. Or maybe I'm reluctant to return to the nursery, a once joyful place that never lost to me. I've been purposely avoiding, not wanting to remember your face and smile and the colorful bright flowers there, or to feel shades of your presence in the subdued light, or to breathe in the fresh oxygen in motor there, reminiscent of your scent. Or maybe the reason why I haven't got rid of them is because all these plants sitting with me here on the balcony in a mournful way remind me of the love we once shared. A happy love, a sad love, a love both fine and tragic when looked upon as a whole, but it's finished and time to give the deceased a decent burial. 
I turned my attention to the other plants that appeared to be doing quite well, actually. Hardy souls, enduring life forms, raising them the right, lifting their semi-translucent pedestals and buds like arms and little soft hands, reaching for the flower. I hear Father's clearing voice again, coming to the foreground, and I think to myself, these are the ones to whom he would grant his approval. And noticing my line of sight, Father says to me, derisively on cue, why can't you be more like them? And just like always, Father knows best. Thank you very much. Sorry for coming. search on Don just to learn more about him and uh, I wasn't going to read this but it's so much about this type of day it's called Spirit Walk. Years covered against a cold wind San Francisco feels like Alaska walking west toward the sea climbing from Mission Street over the hills to work early walking slow as a winter sun rain will return when it's ready bottle brush and mulberry hold their leaves encourage me wishing I could walk all day up these hills and down one step at a time mine clear as winter gazing at trees I could walk to the sea let work wait until tomorrow or another day the wise ones say we don't need money our souls are invisible on crystalline days between storms we are needless in essence crystalline in truth imperceptible between storms the wise ones, perceptive as a flight of gulls gliding along 24th Street, join me in a cold wind. Bottle brush and mulberry hold tight to their leaves. Nice. Yeah. birthday he died in like 1998 or so and he uh, won the Nobel Prize for poetry Mexican poet so here's one by him called as one listens to the rain okay here we go and this was in Spanish originally and I think it must sound much better in Spanish but um, lluvia is rain thanks to my friend here but um uh, okay, so here it goes. Listen to me as one listens to the rain. Not attentive, not distracted. Light footsteps, thin drizzle. Water that is air, air that is time. The day is still leaving. The night has yet to arrive. Figurations of mist at the turn of the corner. Figurations of time at the bend in this pause. Listen to me as one listens to the rain. Without listening, hear what I say with eyes open inward, asleep, with all five senses awake. It's raining like footsteps, a murmur of syllables, air and water, words with no weight. What are we and are? The days and years, this moment, weightless time and heavy sorrow. Listen to me as one listens to the rain. Wet, wet asphalt is shining, steam rises and walks away. Bright unfolds and looks at me. You are you and your body of steam. You and your face of night. You and your hair, unhurried lightning. You cross the street and enter my forehead. Footsteps of water across my eyes. Listen to me as one listens to the rain. The asphalt shining. You cross the street. It is the mist wandering in the night. It is the night asleep in your bed. It is the surge of waves in your breath. Your fingers of water dampen my forehead. Your fingers of flame burn my eyes. Your fingers of air open eyelids of time. A spring of visions and resurrections. 
Listen to me as one listens to the rain. The years go by, the moments return. Do you hear the footsteps in the next room? Not here, not there. You hear them in another time that is now. Listen to the footsteps of time, inventor of places with no weight, nowhere. Listen to the rain turning over the terrace. The night is now more right in the grove. Lightning has nestled among the leaves. A restless garden adrift. Go in, your shadow covers this page. And next is Tom Hol Holberg, uh, followed by Martin Joseph, and then our feature, Gerardo. Southwest with some Australians, and afterwards they give a critique of the tour guide. And my favorite one was from a school teacher who said he uh, he spoke on the microphone with hard candy in his mouth three times. <laughs> <laughs> it was my favorite critique. <laughs> That's another poem. Um, <laughs> excuse me. I believe the mind. <clears throat> I believe that the mind, though vast, is finite. It is like a big city. We can't see it all at once with natural hills and valleys. The buildings use emotions as window blinds, which even when you, when open, we close our eyes sometimes. I know a woman who is full of it. I get sick if I don't get enough of it. <laughs> an apple and an orange the same thing and get away with it or would it just for fun <laughs> the precedent of sorrow is happiness. That's a pity one. Very pity. <laughs> we do what we have to do. We do what we will do. And sometimes on Saturdays, we do what we want to do. One time on Tuesday, 
I kissed a girl, and by Friday, I forgot her name. <laughs> but I'll never forget how we both felt when we did <laughs> Have you ever heard a pharaoh moan? <laughs> or a bristle cone pine? A weeping willow can make an old salt thirsty. Sometimes things grow even in bad weather. <laughs> if you were a girl and I were a boy, oh, forget it. <laughs> <laughs> Remember those things we wished we had done? Well, we did do them in our dreams. Does that mean anything? Yeah. Yeah. Is that it? Yeah. Okay. Is that it? Okay, good. decision. I'll just wait a minute for everybody to settle down. You know, uh, in general, what we try not to do is we, we try to wait until like between the poems so that we're only like moving in front of the poet when the poet is not in the middle of a poem. And I just thought that I would add that and we forgot to announce that at some point. So I'll start again. <clears throat> Good evening, Sacred Grounds. Good evening. <laughs> Yesterday, in a five to four decision of the US Supreme Court, it was announced that there is no aggregate limit on contributions to polit political campaigns across the country. This is yet one more step towards our inevitable march towards one dollar, one vote. In honor of that, I wrote tonight's poem called The United States of Monsanto. Welcome to the United States of what the hell are you going to do about it? The United States of Monsanto, of British Petroleum, of Goldman Sachs, of Blue Cross, of Charles and David Koch. Welcome to the United States of, are they really stealing everything right here in broad daylight? The United States of Citizen United, with the purity of purpose of a single vast funding source imposed upon the United States of, we, the people who aren't united at all. So let's pretend that we don't even see the clues because it's just plain easier that way. There's nothing hidden on the chessboard. The deception is all right in front of you, if you can see it. My brother and sister poets at the Sacred Ground Cafe are united. We all love this Johanna sanctified space that is kept alive by Teddy and Fiona. When we build a barricade to fend off the last sweep of critical thinking from the streets, we will place these sacred chairs and tables in honored positions in the wall. History will record that worldwide corporate fascism was finally defeated, beginning at the corner of Hayes and Cole in the city of San Francisco. We will reserve one table and two chairs on our side of the barricade to allow those on break to sip espressos as the final attack begins. <laughs> now, if 
you're ready. I'm ready. All right, it's time for our feature. <laughs> So look at that clip, look at his eye. <laughs> Gerardo Pacheco. I love the old master's hands, crippled hands, colored hands, black hands. I love father's brown hands. I love mother's skinny hands. I love Sarah's pale hands. I love the grass touching my hands. I love father's cold hands playing his guitar. I love mama's pale hands wearing her turquoise rings. I love her hands holding a pen. I love dead blue hands guiding me through the cold blue desert. I love hands under the sun. I love my hands when they touch your wounds. Your wounds never heal. I love magic dark hands pulling a new rabbit out of a hat. I love the white man's bloody hands smearing freedom on the wall. I love Sarah's hands touching my cold, crippled hands. I love Sarah's hands holding me in spring. I love kissing her hands, even if she, if she smashes my heart to pieces. Wow. Wow. <laughs> the old man is not wearing his old mask. I can see his old wrinkled face. He's not happy or sad. He doesn't smile. He doesn't frown. His jaws move up and down like if he's chewing up a memory. Something bitter that makes him cry. I ask him about old things to break the ice, but he doesn't answer me. He only leaves his arms as he's going to point at something in the sky. But the old man only crosses his hands over his chest to talk. Perhaps the old man doesn't listen to me. Perhaps, perhaps the old man is not an old man, but a shadow of the old man wearing a new mask. <laughs> Another poem about um, an old man. By the road I found the old man sitting at one side of the road in some forsaken town where the air stings dry and old. The old man didn't know where to go. He had just sat down without knowing if he needed to go forward or backward. The old man looked at me puzzled with his tired old eyes. He had an ancient look in his face of solitude and death. The sun burned his old wrinkled yellow skin. The rain had neglected this earth, I thought, while I sat next to the old man. Then his face shone bright as if he knew me from a future, from a future we haven't yet met. I was afraid of touching the old man as he might break into a thousand pieces. I was afraid the wind could take him away. His bones rattled as he tried to tell me something. The wind didn't allow me to hear what the old man had to say. The wind moved the dust away from the rocks with a swift move, like an injured animal does when digging for its bones at night. I've seen the old man holding onto a pile of rocks to prevent his, uh, <clears throat> sorry, 
to prevent this wind from taking him away. I knew the wind could take uh, take away the old man. It has happened before. The wind had blown away in my father's bones. <clears throat> so another one about a, an old man. Shadows in the garden. I've seen the old man standing in front, in front of his garden. The old man watches his garden as if he's as if, as if, um, as if trying to remember something. The old man faces the sun like a ghost dust in spring. I have seen his old shadow too. His warp shadow follows the wind. His shadow hobbles holding a serpent-like hand. His shadow grows taller when the old man holds the sky. His shadow follows him in spring. The old man and shadow have mastered the technique of waiting and watching. The old man counts seeds and roots for the sowing season. The old man watches his plants bloom new flowers. The old man withers thorns and weeds and everything in between. The old man and shadow cut the winter grass. The old man knows all the crows in the world will raid his garden if he's not alert. If he's not ready to fight back. Shadow and man hold hands as if they wait for the sun to fade away. I follow the old man and his shadow slowly across his garden, plucking roots and weeds. Tasting the wind with my splitting tongue, with my splitting tongue. I wonder if my shadow will ever learn to follow me. The old man pauses as if, as if he knows I'm following him. The garden weeds, wind moves to the tall grass. We're only shadows in the garden. Everything is well, the old man whispers, as he pulls his long gray beard. It's only the wind and the sun that play tricks upon me. <laughs> Rock kill. The buzzards are waking up too early to feast on the road kill. It is true. The buzzards won't, won't wait for the sun to begin scavenging for meat and bones. A poor, a poor old deer lays on the road, his eyes still glassy, wide open, watching the feet of its own bones and skin. I can count all of its wide and broken teeth among the twisted bones. The buzzards fight each other personally, personally as they swallow chunks of meat. I witness the feast of, the feast of bones and skin the young bastards wear red crowns of blood as the old bastards stand still on the barbed wire fences waiting for their turn to feed on the road kill. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> right. So I'm gonna read a um, Couple of poems in Spanish. It's actually a, a, a whole poem, but it's broken into three um, sections. If you will. It's about dream. Primer sueño. El corazón se me hace pedazos. La mujer de mi vida, la más hermosa reina de mi vida, está esperando debajo de un árbol. Mi reina la, be la bella está llorando. Porque hoy alguien querido se va a morir. Yo puedo, yo puedo olfatear en el aire un olor a iguana putrefacta. Es el aliento de la muerte. Esa sombra tiliki y flaca que ha llegado cargando su guaraña. Desde el más allá, donde los hombres más valientes lloran. Segundo sueño. Hay una oscuridad maldita en esta casa de voces mansas. No puedo ver mis ojos negros. 
reflejados en los espejos mágicos, en la esquina de este cuarto negro, alguien se ha olvidado de una caja de muerto, forrada con terciopelo, sus esquinas son magníficas, cubiertas de oro matizo, no tiene ningún remache, un hombre viejo ha muerto y descansa en la caja, con mis dedos yo puedo verlo. Mis manos nunca me mienten, el cadáver tiene una tristeza de muerto. Tercer sueño. La casa se ha quemado, una, gritó, una, una voz gritó del más allá. El humo maldito se pierde en el cielo de los santos. Hoy una bebé ha muerto quemada, el aire está lleno de ese olor de chicharra quemada. Su madre también ha muerto de tristeza y desconsuelo. That's the one in Spanish. I promised I was going to read that. <laughs> I'm going to read some poems that some folks have, uh, have listened, um, have opportunity to listen. Yeah. So the first one is the Scarecrow. And there is a voice in the poem that says, a cornfield with no scarecrows is easy target for those damn crows. Yellow leaves bury my feet. The stones hold me down to this earth. Vines and weeds grow around me to snare my voiceless throat. Wooden sticks poke my ribs. Barbed wires hold my hands to the wooden post. Bent nails purse my straw heart. My creator's son shut my mouth. Words I cannot speak of. Charcoal eyes, charcoal nose, charcoal smile, charcoal lips. Headpiece stuffed with straw. I wear grandpa's straw hat, perhaps to remind things I'm old. I hung from a wooden cross made of sticks. I watch over a field of corn and squash. Sometimes I smile, sometimes I frown. It all depends on the season on this earth. At dusk, I watch the shadows, black as crows, march down the road, carrying machetes on their bare backs. I have a huge wooden, I have huge wooden arms wide open to scare as many stubborn crows. Taller than any living man, I resemble a human form. Yet my creator didn't give me life. I'm a ragged scarecrow stuffed with straw. An illusion is standing in the middle of this earth, mumbling words to the hot wind. Whenever the sun stops blinding my charcoal eyes, I wait for the fire to burn it all. I'm riding from the wasteland. I'm riding from the wasteland. Here the earth stings like burning flesh. Here the sun never fades away. Here there are no shadows that follow our dragging feet across the hills made of stones. This is no man's land. This is thistle land. This is crow land. Those who walk barefooted across this wasteland call this land the house of the dead man. The hot wind never stops. Ah, sorry. The hot wind never stops blowing away. The man who sprout like weeds from the earth's womb curse the wind. As the wind blows away the crumbling bones. All day. I can hear the man's never-ending cry. I follow the screeching like a bloodhound. Sun man, sun man curse and speed at the sun as they slowly turn to dust. I can hear the man's crumbly, dusty bones clatter like broken teeth under my feet. This is porn land. Here the weeds and cacti clench to this dry, stony earth with its yellow and white roots before the wind blows them away like crumbling leaves. Here the scarecrows grow roots 
and wait in the middle of the dry fields for the hungry cross to arrive with the gods stuffed with hot stones. This is no man's land. This is Tiso land. This is Crow land. This is the wasteland. The following poems I want to dedicate it to my um, to my father, Cesar Pacheco. Everything is a dream. The road is next down into the desert. I could see I could see someone coming from far away. Perhaps a man carrying something on his back. Perhaps he is another man. Someone alive and behind the heels must have trained this man. Too many men walk by along at night, carrying nothing but more dreams, stuffing corn sacks and burlas. I've seen these men before. They vanish into the silence of the night before their shoes fill up with dust. You can hear the screams fade away after the dogs barking, an echo that never fades away and it stays hiding under the stones. Screams that only quiet down when another man appears down the road carrying something on his back. In summer, I confuse these men with crows like the ones that cow at me when my shadow disappears under the sun. But no, these are the men who go on winding down the road before someone from behind the hill wakes up and remembers everything is a dream. <laughs> Travelers of space and time. We arrive to the fields with the night carrying nothing in our empty burning bellies, thirst and tired breaking of smoke and dust. We're travelers of space and time, hopping over the dry sticks so gently, like thieves' footsteps over the broken glass. We are informed shadows of the night, cowing and screeching, hungry and tired, swallowing hot stones to ease our pain. We are shadows carrying nothing but our souls, stuffed with straw, holding giant stones prevent our souls from flying away. We go through the fields looking for the last drought of our seeds no one, want, no one wants anymore. Our black coats are coated with dust and thorns. We tie black feathers around our necks for protection against the sun. Some think we are wandering crows. Others believe we are lonely spirits following the stars. We are travelers of space and time. And this is going to be the last one, and I do uh, uh, thank you, um, everybody, for being here. And uh, thank you. Father, die when the waves smash against this earth, when the old fisherman came back from the sea with nothing in his nets, when the hungry children ran around with their bellies burning within. When the wind took away our voices, when the old sheep crackled as the sea swallowed them, when the seamen wished to live in the desert, when the seagulls scavenged for eggshell, when the sun baked our brown bodies, when the cool mud wet our feet, when the shadows learned to love the sun, when the birds' wings banged against the wind, when the old grandmothers had scraped the bottom of pots, looking for the last bits of fish to swallow. When father died, the whole sea divided us. Thank you so much and good night.
so now we'll take a 10 minute break, uh, support our hosts, talk to each other, and uh, we'll be back in another 10 minutes. Greg Pond will take ma'am. over the mic, uh, and uh, we have a few more Cheap. poets and uh, raffle to do. There we go. Good thing to
I really like it, and I got it online. And, uh, <laughs> Are we going to take this stuff in power?
age slipped away. Even my name I could not say. I live by the sound of the crow. outside my window. They gather like undertakers in slit black suits. One faces me and calls. Call, call, call. The bells of Peter and Paul ring nine times. Bong, bong, bong. Someone I feel is dying. Still in bed, I am now just waking. Every day begins age. Live, be old. <laughs> Two short poems because I'm actually here as a poet and a publisher. Our incredible feature today, the poet Pacheco, has a forthcoming book, which uh, my small independent press out of San Francisco is publishing. Here's a mock-up of the front of it. And um, I am here tonight to let you know the book will be out by end of May, beginning of June. I have a pre-publication price tonight of $12. If you're interested, that would include postage for me to send it to you. And um, he is one of our finest poets in the area. And you know, when I started coming to my reading series at Sweet Sanctum, and I was just always overwhelmed by the quality and the shamanistic uh, visionary aspects of his work. So um, Bobby Coleman and I, who co-edited the Occupy SF Poems from the Movement anthology, and uh, we, we just said we have to we have to get a book out of this. So uh, this is Crowland, which is a line from his poem he read tonight, writing from the wasteland. Is that right? Yeah. So you heard you heard this tonight. So um, <laughs> please support independent publishing, support our incredible feature tonight, Geraldo Pacheco. And um, if you want to get a pre publication price of $12, let me know. I have a little form to give you and a receipt. And if not, look out for it. When it comes out, it will be in bookstores, distributed by small press distribution as well. Thank you. Last week, it's kind of the, trying to do a departure from like reading those just serious, soulful poems. I was kind of soaking myself in. I'm trying to. This is a bit of a departure. So um, I'm just kind of just babbling. But um, no, I have this project going. It's like there, are, there are a lot of stereotypes in the world, and I'm working at debunking them. And last week, I started. One, but I didn't get very, I didn't get as far as I wanted to. So like, the, the, it's like the stereotype I'm working on is that um, Germans aren't funny. So I'm <laughs> out here to prove that it's not true. Um, so it's like I floated it out to like you know some people I know in Germany, and they started just sending me all these jokes by email. Just you know they're 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 with me. They're with me back in the old country. They're gonna help me prove that it's, <laughs> it's not true. Germans really are funny. So I got all these jokes sent to me by email, and I was going through them, and I'm like, okay, okay, okay. But there was one that I was really just kind of compelled to, I was really wrestling with it, and I just thought, okay, I think that's the one. The only problem was, um, I didn't get it. <laughs> um, so, um, but you know, this one just, you know, something just gets in your craw, and I go, I, I gotta, I just gotta understand this one before I get it, you know, you know, I just, okay, I, I thought about, well, maybe it wouldn't, wouldn't it be interesting to just sort of like, Come up here, tell the joke, even if I don't get it. This is the response I get. I'm okay. <laughs> but, if, if, but but you know, I, I, 
nick that mix that thought. So I just, you know, the person who sent it to me and I said, okay, can you explain this to me? He says, no, well, either you get it or you don't. I go, well, come on, you know, I'm going to explain it. And I go, well, this, this is, okay, here's another stereotype that Germans like to explain things. They're good at dissertations <laughs> and philosophy and, and all that. And I read enough German philosophy in college. I go, well, come on, explain it, explain it. That's, that's supposed to be one of your strengths. <laughs> no, no, okay, so that's enough. I guess that's, that's the next stereotype. The Germans like to explain things. I guess maybe that was not true either. Um, so anyway, she just wouldn't explain it to me. So um, I told it to a friend of mine who just happens to be Italian. I don't think this is important to the story, but she happens to be Italian. And, um, you know, I didn't get it, but I explained it to her, and she laughed. She just laughed kind of heartily, like, you know, a good hearty Italian laugh. And then she said, okay, well, it was funny. She laughed, but she just basically thought Germans just weren't funny. So. I slapped her and called her a racist. <laughs> she deserved it, but um, so anyways. But anyways, the good part is she explained it to me, and I get it. So I'm gonna tell the joke. Um, okay. So one of the things you gotta know there's um, there's a dog in the joke, and um, okay, dogs in this country, you know, they're usually typically named Spot, Fido, um, Rover, things like that. American names for dogs. So. But in Germany, I asked, well, okay, I asked, what do the, Ger what, what the Germans name their dogs? And I, I did get that out of her. She wouldn't explain the joke, but I did ask her, what are the, what are the German names for dogs? This is good. Um, got four of them. Rex, Struby, Hasso, and Tarzan. Tarzan. I mean, I, I think I'm not, I, I like the name Struby, so it's always a joke. There's a dog in the joke, and the dog's name is Stroopy. So, okay. So, Stroopy and his master are walking, doing the river walk in Berlin, and the river is there, it's called the River Spree. They're walking along it, and Stroopy is close to the water, and um, some, this man is walking in the opposite direction. He sees the Stroopy and his owner, and Stroopy, it looks like he's, he's, he's above the water, and the man is staring at him, and thinking, oh God, what's going on? Is, is that dog surfing? Maybe. And go, is he like walking on little rocks? And go, no, no, it's not. It looks like he's really walking on water. So so he, he goes to the dog's owner and he says, Well, what's what's with your dog? Uh, he, he he he's he's walking on water. And the guy says, Well, what do you expect him to do? He doesn't know how to swim. <laughs> All right. I I got okay, the Germans are funny. All right, it's working. It's working. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. All right. <laughs> okay, I think I'm up, in, up next. I'm going to read a couple. Uh, this one is entitled This one is entitled Final Call When hope is gone It gets replaced by hate The love we were given Has been lost Since we've been living In this culture of violence and rape Proposals for change Like, su like suggestions Proposals for control Like su suggestions for change suddenly fall on the deaf its ears and bites the dust that thickens on shelves during midterm election years. When our feelings reel from madness to sadness to glad it wasn't us, then something's gotta be done. Annihilation awaits any nation that loves its guns more than its sons and loves its daughters just a little bit less or better yet, not much at all. A generation is left to fend for itself while a nation ignores its final call. <laughs> Ben's overwhelmed. Ben's overwhelmed. He ain't been himself. Too proud to ask, fearing strings attached too tight to yield to the pressure he feels, to this test of will that hunts and haunts and hurts until the weight of the world causes emotions to spill from the bucket of tears a 
across the rainy day sill. Ben's overwhelmed, but he does his best. Got a tough field to hold, with big shoes to fill, even though they're his own. And all that he used to know, he ain't sure of anymore. Reluctant to seek shelter from life's sudden storms. Ben's overwhelmed. He's a bit depressed. Sinking in a pool of quicksand, reaching for a lifeline or hand that may change his status from an independent man who's too strong to fall, to one too weak to walk at all but tall enough to stand. Ben's overwhelmed. He's really stressed. If he should scream out from the top of his lungs, from the roof of his mouth, will it sound louder than a tree falling in the forest or a silent shout? Will anyone feel compelled enough to look down the well and see him stuck at the bottom of his luck, then drop a bucket on a rope and hope it's strong enough to hoist his sorry ass up. Ben's overwhelmed, he's under duress. So down in the dumps where he sometimes gets stuck to the floor of the mental prison cell he's been trying to escape from. Will anyone ever respond to his muted cry for help? Will anyone be there to offer rescue when days get gray? when Sonny gets blue, or when Ben gets too overwhelmed. Thank you. Um, just, uh, just to let you know, next week our feature will be Harold Terrasen. Uh, and on the 16th, Tom Odegaard. Yeah. Uh, feature, right? And the 23rd, Roy Mash. And on the 30th, Don Alpina. And uh, next up, we have uh, uh, one of our feature artists. And that will be Eddie. Oh, Eddie. Surely, mean 
much more than to earn none. Uh, this one here, they just put in a, two more hospitals, they put it up in a, uh, that's five hospitals and the doctors put this up uh, on their bulletin for people to read. I do them to the, them because I guess that's why I wrote it. To, uh, we don't sell our magic sometimes, I guess. <coughs> this, is, this is called I Died for a Cigarette, and some of you might not have heard it, so I always have to read it because it's always somebody that might not have heard it. I try to stop smoking, but it seems I can't quit. Because each time I tried, I had a nicotine fit. I felt kind of funny. In fact, I went nuts. I was digging in ash trees for cigarette butts. I remember the times that I stood up till four. I was gathering my change for some Arabic store. Now I lay here with cancer, with the guilt and regret that I ever lit up that first cigarette. One led to another, and soon it was packs, and I smoked like a train with my lungs on the tracks. I never would listen to the Surgeon General's warning, and I would light up another as I had awakened each morning. I tried to stop smoking, but I couldn't stop the crave, and I died for a cigarette. She was written on my grave. One led to another, and now my lungs are all black. And someday you might see what I mean. When you die from a smoke, you'll see there's no joke. Just your lungs on an x-ray machine. I tried to stop smoking, but I just couldn't quit. And I gave up my life to my nicotine fit. So if my money is funny and my credit still talks, please bury my ashes in a cigarette box. Thank you, Eddie. And we have one more poet left 
for the evening, unless there's anybody who wants to read who hasn't signed up. Okay, last call. Now, um, and that will be our mini feature. And uh, first I'd like to give our thanks to our feature of the evening, Gerardo Pacheco. <laughs> and our, now for our mini feature of the evening, it was, uh, the, it was here last week and did a great job. And back again, Francisco Furman Cantona. <laughs> So I'm going to read from my book again um, that, I read, that I read from last week. What's the name of it? It's called Regarding the White Canvas. First poem I'm going to read is called The Death of a Love Poem. If I could find a word to describe the way I feel about you, that word would grow branches. Blooming with all those things you do that make me swoon. Lying on a petal of passion, calling out your name. One pull after another, a million daisies stand for what they say. Loves me, I hold my breath. Loves me not, my heart races. Loves me. A reoccurring dream of streams that flow to form silk stream cascades. Floats my hope, floats my body, but nothing compares to this embrace. Roses are red, violets are blue. No one writes like this anymore. Control, alt, delete. <laughs> this is um, the first poem of the book. It's called The Open Path. I come bare and can tell its permanence. And where am I being without altar? since I started the open path. In the found scope of my vision, trudging through an absolute vision, I, honest as nature, taking its course, know I am and no longer think or search for a specific. Came Athena passing, or could have been her path long before, bid me greetings and a handshake, as honest as the verse we spoke. Divinari, you walk a course so rare to find within a time so sound asleep with its delights. And yet you found a way to wake and see meaning and purpose to the life you seek. Tell me, Divinari, what is the meaning of life? Ah, great goddess, that I could answer. For that I have questioned and answered myself in this path we stand. The meaning of life is finding what it is one needs to become what they are. about the monument that stands in the middle of Union Square. Um, there on the top, um, there's a, um, a female posing. And some of, some of you may know it's Alma, um, that married, um, her name is Alma de Verville Spreckles. And um, it's basically uh, about how she brought art into the city of San Francisco. So I got really inspired by that. Um, that monument. It's called the prospect of possibility. The present is relevant in the there nearby, as gifts bring riches, riches to the poor deprived. Why stand by or by to its gratify? The purpose is to live in a realized prospect by the grant to improve and to form a present condition to a future conquest. For the marriage of Alma and the sacred Baron, let us look onto, onto the commander's monument praising struggle, myth, and legend. And what of the young marrying the old, the poor engaged with a rich old bastard, yet the nudist walks in bearing likeness and robes society in fangled antics. In the possible, all is of what was in the presence of mind. Um, this poem is called Regarding the White Canvas, and it is the um, the title of the book. How I wish for a movable feast, 
Perhaps where land may cease to exist in the blue, the clouds, the sun, drips from the sky, drips from the sky, stale watercolor delights. I, creator of the things all shall come to understand, creator of the thing regarded as a household name, with a brush will, re re will reveal my strength, with a stroke will reveal my pain, without lending urgency to doubt. The thing itself, when man comes to its senses, will go without saying regarding the white canvas. Until I come to this end, come to this edge of the drifting sky, will understand that a canvas of land drips, drips, drips. that I wrote in here were inspired of my travels in Russia and um, in China and also um, all around Europe. And um, one of the great things about um, um, going to another country is discovering a book that was written in that place. And um, when I was there, I discovered um, The Master and Margarita by Bulgakov. Amazing book. If any of you have never read it, you should look for it. It's called The Master Margarita. But um, a poem came from it that, um, that I wrote because I got inspired by it. And it's called The A Tram. And it's about how. It's basically about a cat. Because <laughs> there's a cat in that book. The cat and the tram come along conveniently and invite folks on. The cat announces, tram is ready for boarding, but for a small price. The passengers board and brace themselves from the speed they lose sense of time and are overcome with weightless and relief that the streets they trudge becomes a little brief. The passengers pay, the passengers pay close heed to the cat's conduct as it grits, as it, uh, sorry, as it greets and bids, narrates streets destinations in the native tongue. The folks orderly exit the tram and murmur to the cat, Godspeed. that were there that uh, went to Yale, Brown, and um, Harvard, and, and I asked them, what's it like um, being taught by Harold Bloom? <laughs> and they said, well, you know, <laughs> he's really big now. They say he's pretty old. He basically just scratches his tummy when he lectures. <laughs> but because of Harold Bloom, I think I understood literature. Um, it made sense to me. Um, the way he critiqued it. So, so this poem is about Harold Bloom. It's called The Man in Bloom. What can prompt me to have a dialogue with the man in bloom, killing his precursors with self-reliance? I think about Nirvana and the Come As You Are theme and wonder how literal it, I can be if the dialogues I speak is seeds from becoming grains. Yet it occurs to me on a stack of hay where I compose and harness all I come to know. This is my time to rise and address my dialogue to the Academy of Fine Ideas where the man in bloom resides. I am not ready to kill, I would say, but I am willing to be killed by its strength. Let, let us have a dialogue about how art can kill with heartfelt, earnest, and brilliant madness. I would say that to the man in bloom. For it, is, for it is what keeps me alive. Thank you. Thank you, poets. Um, a great evening of um, good poetry. Or a good evening of great poetry. Yeah, I was just saying. <laughs> <laughs> um, Before, before everything goes. Uh, this is this you? Yes, me. All right. This is uh, Eddie Sanchez. Life is a cartoon. Uh, he's on um, an exhibit at Hospitality House Community Arts Program, 
April 11th through May 16th. Right. It's on Market Street? Yeah. This okay. is on, Market yeah, six. yes, Market and Six, exactly. Oh, Hours yeah. on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 1 to 6 p.m., Tuesday and Thursday, 10 to 3 p.m. And the reception is Friday, April 11th from 5 to 7. That's oh, all right. Right on. Right. And, uh, and one more announcement. Uh, Stephanie Manning and I will be featured at La Promenade this Saturday at 7 o'clock. That's on Balboa and 38th, right across from the Balboa Theater. Oh. It's an open mic, so bring your poems and just Is that again, yeah, it's a, it's a cafe. I've never been there before, oh, but... Um, promenade? Yeah, La Promenade, yeah, cafe. Don was hosting, was hosting now. Yeah, um, Stephanie and uh, I think Dan Brady agreed to, when he's recovered, to... Uh, it's a monthly uh, poetry event. Anyway, uh, we have some fantastic prizes here, and uh, we'll get the card shuffled, and uh, we will pass out these prizes. Um, among the prizes is the mini feature, which is eight minutes, which uh, Francisco had this, uh, today. Uh, eight minutes, but it's only good for one week, so you have to be back next week to take advantage <laughs> of that. Uh, it expires. And uh, we have uh, some books. Uh, we have Barbary Coast. We have uh, Armistead Martins, uh, The Days of Anna Madrigal. We have National Geographic. We have uh, uh, 20 years, 20 poems, Steve Mackin. Uh, and um, we have a couple other things. We have a CD, some rock group, I'm not sure who it is. Um, there is a little box, with a little index, <laughs> box, index card in it. You know, uh, there's also a great organizer. Walt Disney Classic Storybook. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Nelson DeMille of Country. Hopefully it's about uh, Southeast Asia. Asia, I don't know very much about it. but anyway. So, here we are, and we are going to start with the first winner of the evening. Hope oh, it's still here. And number two is Sally Love Saunders, Sally Love. All right? Next winner, number 10. Number 10 is Virginia Barrett. Oh, there you Ooh, go, nice. Virginia. You get to get one of these fantastic All right. Oh, oh. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> oh, that was nice. He said he wanted it. I had to make very, sure he very got very it. Very <laughs> very nice. Nice. I never win anything. <laughs> All right, next is number 13, Eddie. Eddie. You better enjoy that. Nope. I know. <laughs> Oh, that means oh, all right. 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 All
remember. I just told you I am that old. All right. So that's eight minutes next week, Karen. All right. The next winner is number three, Owen. Owen Douglas. All right. All right.